fathers today. We want to say happy Father's Day to a dad's life. But I want you to know that my message today that the Lord gave me um, goes for everyone. Like I always say, whether I preach on Mother's Day or I um, doesn't matter what I preach, it's for the body of Christ. Amen. My audience is not just dads today. My audience is all males, all females, married, single, divorced, mar uh, uh, what, what else are the categories? You know, whatever all the ca categories are, it's for you. In other words, this word is for you. You see, one thing about the kingdom of God is it's um, this word that Bishop uses. To me, it means something, but his word that he uses is it's, tra it's a transcendent gospel, yeah. meaning it goes across cultures. It goes across gender. It goes across absolutely every um, uh, career life, whether you're a truck driver, whether you're a teacher, <laughs> Whether you're a videographer, whether you're, doesn't matter what you are, it, it goes, it, it covers it all. And I love that because really if you teach and you preach and you um, read the uncompromised word of God, it's usable for everyone's life. Yeah. It's functionable. Yeah. If this word doesn't function, it's no good to me. I'm a very practical individual, and the first time I ever heard Bishop preach, it was in the other sanctuary, and I thought, wow, this is something I can, this is something I can do tomorrow when I go to work. It, it was functional to me. It was usable to me. It was relative to my life. So I'm here to tell you that what you're going to hear today is relative to your life. So you know in this house how we, um, you know, it's not that... I'm just going to say that I'm going to preach about family today. <laughs> hey, I am going to preach about family today. Now, if you're in the house for a long time, you know why that's funny um, in a way. It, it, okay, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But I want you to know that every family starts with a man. Every family starts with a father. Every family starts with a dad. But I don't know how we get mixed up sometimes with, you know, how families should start and, and the order of the family. And remember on Mother's Day, I preached um, a national help day, yeah. helpmate day. And, um, and I established, once again, from the word of God, reminded us all of the order of the kingdom of God. God over Jesus, Jesus over the man, man over the, or pastor, pastor over the man, man over the woman, woman over the child, child over the dog, dog over the cat, cat over the mouse, mouse over the cheese. There is an order. There's a progression, right? Well, I heard the Lord say, upside down. And I knew immediately what he meant when he said upside down. He said, he, what he means is that uh, even in the church, they have taken the order of the kingdom of God and turned it upside down. The, the children telling the mom, no. The, the children telling the mom, I need to go here. I mean, the children demanding of the parents what they should be doing. The men and the women in churches demanding the pastor to do this or to do that. The, it, it's upside down. Right. Not in this house. <laughs> But it's, it's upside down. And, and, and so we're going to see some things of what God wants to show us today. So the title of my message is A Change of Direction. And I have a portion of scripture, Genesis 2.15, and we're going to stay here for a while. <clears throat> and um, it starts with, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And it starts with, And the Lord God took the man. And he put him into the Garden of Eden. I'm going to stop right there. I didn't even read the whole verse. He, he took the man and he put him into the Garden of Eden. Now, Eden is a spot. It's a delightful spot. So he took man. If you backed up a few verses, it would, he, he would talk about how he made man. He formed him, blew some, the breath of God in him, and gave him a soul. And, and so now he's here and he's got this man. He goes, bam, there you are in the middle of a garden. And I put you there. And what is in the garden? His presence. So the first thing that we see that God did for man was to put him into his presence. Now let me tell you the first thing that he didn't do. 
He didn't give him a woman first. <laughs> no, he put him inside his presence, inside the garden, inside this delightful spot. That's what he did first. Now, his presence, we've been talking a lot in this last season about his presence. 40 days prior to Passover, we were praying and fasting for his presence because we declared at a house, we, want, we don't want anything more than we want the presence of God. Bishop last week just preached a message um, entering or the entrance to his presence. And he taught us about the process to get into his presence, right? And, you know, Psalms 101, in, if you didn't hear that message, or is it 100? Okay, Psalms 100, if you didn't hear that message, then you probably want to hear it. It's, it's good. And then I think, okay, well, what's all this talk about his presence? If the very first thing he did for man was take man and put him inside in the garden in his presence, then why do we keep talking about it? We're there. Are we there or are we not there? Did we leave the garden? Did we move away from, did we leave his presence? So many people are trying to accomplish their life and build their family outside the garden. And God said, the first thing I want to give man is I want to put him there because that's where my presence is. And that's the only way that you'll really create the family according to my word. You have to have his presence. So the first thing he does for us is gives us his presence. Now, the biggest challenge for man is to stay there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, once we get there, that's great. But the biggest challenge is now you got to stay there because we get so distracted with something that looks a little attractive out just outside the garden, just outside, so close. I can see it from I'm in the garden. I can see it. I'm so close. Next thing you know, I'm out there. And next thing you know, I see something else a little farther away and I'm out there. And I continue, and man continues with that process, and pretty soon, they're away from his presence. <laughs> so we, our biggest challenge is we've got to stay there. <laughs> so, like I said, transcendent message. So all you um, single people in the house who are not dads yet, Again, I want to remind you, the first thing to make sure that you know God didn't give you was a woman. You're going to get, you're going to, it's upside down. If you got the woman before you got his presence, okay. that means you got the woman when you weren't in his presence. That woman should meet you in his presence. But what do we do? We go outside of the garden and find a woman and then we drag her back to church and want her to be inside his presence. Now I got lucky. I found my husband, or should I say, he found me inside church. And I've been here ever since. I've been in church more than the average individual. I've been, to, I've been in church 90% of my life. I've been in church. Now I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining at all, but I'm just saying, don't be fooled wherever you meet somebody, you know, I mean, take, you know, take heed, look, be aware. What do we always try and do? Change people. We like them out there and then we want to bring them back here and we want them to change. I think women are more apt to do this than men, quite honestly. But the same, remember, I'm, we're preaching to everybody here. <laughs> And God said the first thing he gave man was his presence. So we have to stay there. Eve met Adam in his presence. Eve did not meet Adam outside the garden. And then, you know, while following back to the garden. No, she met him. Of course, she was made in the garden, but she met him in the garden. <clears throat> so... I'm still in Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing, he said to dress it. Why did he put him in the garden of Eden? 
to dress it. So those three words, to dress it. So the second thing God gave man was work. Uh -oh. <laughs> True statement. Dress means, in the Hebrew, work. It means labor. It means husbandmen. It means serve, enslave, bring to pass, cause to. So then God gave man a job. Okay. So point number two, the second thing God gives man is work. Now let me tell you, you don't need a woman before you have a job. Okay. <laughs> you have to have a job, right? And you all know Bishop's doctrine on four streams of income. You know, the four streams of income that proceed out of the Garden of Eden, he says three are for me and one is for him. And he's absolutely right. So don't think you can have a woman without three streams of income or a job, right? Yep, you're going to need it. That's right. God's priorities, <laughs> God's priorities are pretty clear here. He says, I'm going to put you in the garden in my presence, and then I'm going to give you some work. Okay. I'm going to see if you can work in this garden before I bring you a woman. Oh. Good. <laughs> so there is some, um, can I say, there is some, uh, what's the word, you know, motivation to get to work. Because okay. <laughs> you're not going to get a woman until then. At least one inside the garden. So... Now, to dress it, funny, to dress it. When I read those words, uh, put them in the garden to dress it, of course, at work for sure, but I think about the amount of money it takes to dress an individual. <laughs> Some of us, it takes more money than others to dress us. So th thus, the reason for the job, the reason for work. If we look at the next portion of Genesis 2.15, God says he took man, put him in the garden to dress it and what? To keep it. Now, keep there means a lot of different words that are kind of fun to talk about. Um, it means to attend to. Now, Pastor Aaron and Melissa know firsthand you can't have a garden and not attend to it. Or it becomes a weed field. <laughs> apparently Melissa's saying that's all it is apparently they haven't been attending to it so the third thing God gave man was the responsibility to keep it okay. it's responsibility yeah. it's responsibility and work to keep a garden I used to have this sign back you know 18 years ago when I thought I wanted a garden and it said the Garden of Whedon. It <laughs> didn't say the Garden of Eden by any means. It was the Garden of Whedon, because that's all it required was Whedon. I got rid of that sign, got rid of the garden, and haven't looked back since. <laughs> so God, the third thing God gave man was responsibility to attend to it, to cultivate it. Cultivate. Cultivate. Let that settle in. Now, I was raised on a farm, so I understand the word cultivate. I realized, though, uh, when I was talking to Bishop about it, he kept trying to say, you know, explain. I go, no, that's called the heralds. Now, I know what a cultivator is. You're talking about the heralds. And then I realized when I, I it really was bothering me, so I looked up an image of the cultivator, and sure enough, he's right. I don't know what heralds are, but whatever. But what I was confused with was the colopactor, colopactor, big rolly thing, you know. Yeah, I don't know. All I know is I was told to get on the tractor and drive, and that's what I did <laughs> as a child. So, you know, whatever it was called, there it is. But cultivate. God said, keep it, the responsibility to cultivate, nourish it, attend to it. So, do you ever get the feeling now, there's still no woman yet. Okay. There's still no woman. You have to get the weeds out. We're, God's just seeing if we'll follow instructions. Yeah, okay. Will we stay in the garden in his presence? Right, yeah. Will we, you know, work it? Yeah. Okay. 
Will we tend to it? Will we cultivate it? Will we nurture it? If you've ever planted anything, you know, but from seed, you're out there looking for the green to come, you know? You're, you're attending to it. Is, it. is it coming up yet? That's how I do it. I mean, I'm, I'm anxious to see where the fruit is. I'm anxious to see, you know, the fruit of my hands and my labor, you know, watering it, fertilizing it, whatever. So responsibility to cultivate, to make it better, to make it better. If you just take land and you don't do anything beyond plant seed, don't do anything after that, <laughs> you're going to need my, my sign, the Garden of Eden. No, but if you attend to it, if you bring out the best in that ground, if you can make that ground produce, God's giving you some practice with this garden. Can you make it produce? Can you maximize the results? Can you make it fruitful? Do you ever get the idea that God's giving you um, a garden to practice with before he brings you a woman? <laughs> He's going to see if you can do it. Well, how many think that, you know, you're ready for a woman? Don't answer that if you have one because it's too late. If you don't, then you at least know the process. Okay, so we're still in Genesis 2.15, and we're still on the last piece of that um, verse, and it says to keep it. Now, another... um, Definition in the Hebrew of keep is to hedge about as with thorns. It immediately took me back to um, in California when uh, Bishop and I preached at this ex-gang church and, on, and all along the walls they had this honking like glass stuck in the wall on top so people wouldn't, you know, climb over. A hedge, hedge about with thorns. Don't let anybody in who ought not be in. To guard, to protect. So the fourth thing that God gave man was the authority to keep that garden. The authority to keep it. The authority to guard the garden. Can you keep the fruit from being destroyed? Can you keep that fruit from predators? Now, we've been challenged with that in our yard recently. I was out, you know, weeding the berm here a week and a half ago or something. Bishop and I both were. And I, w- I looked at our hosta and I went, oh, those bunny rabbits. First they eat the tulips, and now they're eating my hosta. What bunny rabbits eat hosta? And, of course, we planted lemon you know, to avoid them eating tulips. It works, but it, that lemon takes over your whole yard, so I don't know if I'd recommend that. But can you keep, can you keep predators from your fruit? Keep it. God put man in the garden. He told him to dress it, to work it, and he told them to cultivate it, and it, now he's telling them to guard it. Guard what you have. If you don't guard what you have, you won't have it. So um, the last week of school, I get a picture from Bishop, and it's this picture of, um, I recognize the location right away. It was our berm, but it was this huge deer, and it had hosta coming out both sides of its mouth. And, and uh, he writes a little caption underneath it and says, I, I caught the bunny. Green-handed. It's kind of a large one. (laughs) Or green mouth. Yeah, that's what it was. I was thinking red-handed. Green mouth. I caught it. I'm not kidding you. It was the funniest thing ever. So can you keep your fruit from predators? Guard the garden. Now, we're not talking about women still yet, are we? So all those things man had to do before God thought that he needed a helpmate. What do you need a helpmate for if you're not doing anything? What do you need a helpmate for if you're not keeping a garden, tending it, working it, dressing it, keeping it, gardening it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 
So the last thing, are you ready for this? The last thing that God gave man was his word. So I'm on to the next verse, Genesis 2:16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Now we know God's word is our foundation. It's our instructions for life. And basically, one thing so far, he told the man, don't touch the tree. That one tree, don't touch it. Now, is woman formed yet? Not yet. So woman didn't hear that instruction. All this time, people been blaming the woman. All this time, poor Eve has gotten a bad rap. And the point is, God gave the instruction to the man, and the woman wasn't even there yet. Yep, he didn't guard it, did he? So, but here's what we need to see in this, is that God's intention was for the man to teach the woman. Change of direction. Us women think we're supposed to teach the man because they don't know anything. And the reason we think that is because, possibly anyway, because maybe we grew up in homes that um, the man and the dad didn't know much or at least didn't portray that he did or didn't spend the time so anyone knew what he knew or well, on goes the story. Wasn't, absolutely wasn't in his presence. Now, I'm here to tell you nothing frustrates a woman more than a man who doesn't know. If I ask a question, I want my husband to know. <laughs> now, hey, I'm okay with the answer I don't know yet, but I'll, I, will, uh, seek the, I will seek the presence of God. I will seek Lord, the Lord on that. I will find the answer according to his word. I'm okay with that. But to hear the words, you know, when I say, what do you think? And, and not that I ever hear this, but I've heard it as a child all my whole life with, you know, um, when my mother would ask my dad, well, what do you think? And he'd go, well, I don't know. What do you think? Change of direction. Change of direction. So women need to know where we're supposed to go. It doesn't mean we don't know anything. It just means we have to, you know, we're expecting to be given direction. That's the way God intended it to be, right? So he's, it's intended. You're probably going, what does this have to do with being a father? I'm getting there, okay? <laughs> women are looking for knowledge and direction. That's and the bottom line. And so now we're going to go down to Genesis 2.18, the next verse down. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Oh, we're finally getting to the woman part here. Okay. I know, Robert, you were worried. Robert Wagner's back there going, I don't know about this message. When am I going to get this woman? It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate. Okay, so let's, take, let's break that down. It's not good that the man should be alone. Why? Because he's in his presence, because he's working, because he's capable of cultivating okay. um, and nourishing and attending to, because he can protect and because he can teach the word. It's not good that that man be alone. Oh. Okay. Now, if you know a man that doesn't like his presence, doesn't have a job, doesn't want to work, can't improve people even if they tried, don't want to, will, refuses to protect anything around him, and doesn't know the word of God, that man deserves to be alone. <laughs> Change of direction. Change of direction. I don't know if you're liking this message or not. <laughs> so.
So, 2.18, Genesis 2.18, I will make him a help me. So, five things God gave men, his presence, the ability to work, the responsibility to cultivate. You see, when he made him a helpmate, now the man takes on some new, new things. Everything he did with the garden, now that woman is part of his garden. And he has to make sure they're in the presence. And he has to make sure that he has the ability to work. And he has to make sure that he loves her like Christ loved his wife, the church. He has to make sure that he washes her with the word. That he makes sure that he removes every spot and wrinkle and blemish. That's a big thing. You got a big job ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, some of us require more work, Elder Christy says. The things that God gave man, the authority to guard that garden, and then he gave him the word to teach it. So, I mean, I could pick on some things about you know, the authority to guard the garden, well, okay. So even if he told, even if he taught um, Eve the word, he still has to guard that garden. And when she was over there next to that other tree, he should have been guarding her. He should have been protecting her. Now, I could talk, I could preach for that a while, but that's not the message. Because God is saying it's a change of direction. He said upside down. And so isn't it true that when we look at the way our culture has begun to do things, it's backwards, it's contrary to the Word of God. But yet, you know what, if we don't know any better, we accept it because that's what we see and that's what we've lived with when we grew up. If you grew up in with um, parents that, you know, weren't born again and, and hearing the Word of God. So if man gave five things to... I mean, excuse me, if God gave five things to man, well, guess what? He gave those same five things to fathers. So he gave fathers his presence, the ability to stay in the garden in his presence. He gave fathers the ability to work, to be a provider for their family. He gave them the responsibility to cultivate them to train those children, to wash them with the water of the word. I mean, there's so many children today that are left to themselves. And the Bible says that a child left to himself is the devil's workshop. I teach those kids today that have been left to themselves. Now, not all of them, but a lot of them. And it is the devil's workshop. So, God gave fathers the responsibility to cultivate them, keep the weeds out, right? He gave them the responsibility to wash them with the word, to give them knowledge and direction. When a child comes to a parent and says, ask a pointed question, the parent should have an answer. And it should be an answer of truth and wisdom. It should be an answer that really does answer the question. Have you ever asked a parent a question and they give you some lame answer and it's like, what's that got to do with the, what I asked you? They, either they got distracted talking about the story or what. I don't know. But So God gave fathers the fourth thing, same thing he gave man, the authority to guard that garden. As fathers today, it is your responsibility to keep those children from the world. Now, that doesn't mean you, you know, you, you know, chain them up at home and never let them go anywhere. Uh, That's not what that means. It means you train them up and you keep them from danger. And you, you, you little systematically, step by step, give them a, a little more. And when they've earned um, the ability to make good decisions, you give them a little more and you let them a little more freedom. And it's a process. It's not just, bam, one day you're 16, so here's the cars and here's the keys, see you later. No, a lot has had to take place prior to that. You had to keep them from the world. You have to protect those children from the enemy. 
The enemy is afraid of this next generation because I'm here to tell you this next generation is going to be, I don't care what anybody says, I'm pulling out all the cards and this is the way it is with God. And they want the truth. And they're not, don't, don't be religious. You're not going to fool me with some religious jargon. You're not going to fool me with some stupid, um, you know, uh, what do I want to say, um, system that you've learned and that you've done your whole life that hasn't worked. Yeah. Come on, there you go. God gave fathers five things. And he let them practice in the garden. And then he said, I'm going to bring you a helpmate. And he let him practice on the woman, his wife. But today we have children before we have a wife. Upside down. God's changing that direction. We have born again men in this house. <laughs> yes. And those born again men are learning how to be the priests of their home. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's rare. People don't know what it looks like. And in the beginning, women don't even like it because they like being the boss. But when truly... When a man is the priest of his home and follows these five things that God gave him, I'm telling you the, the harmonious, the harmo the harm harmonious um, spirit that is in the house that is all about glorifying God is more powerful than anything that anyone could ever produce. So fathers, protect them from the enemy. Something so silly, this is, you're going to laugh at me when I say this. Something so ridiculous and so silly as how they dress. I know the difference between a student that shows up in sweatpants, which they're not supposed to wear, by the way, and a student that shows up in jeans. I know the difference in my own self, in the quality of my work, in the, and just the, the mode I'm in mentally when I've got sweatpants on. Oh, and I've got dress pants on. It's completely different. So you might think that's a silly little thing, but you know what? It might be the beginning. I've watched kids wear a hat, pull it down and with a flat bill, and they turn into somebody else. They turn into this gangster wannabe. It's a silly little thing. But protect them from the enemy. It's a mindset. I go in the girl's bathroom at school, and this girl is sobbing. I mean sobbing. And, and she's talking to, sounds like a mother, on the phone saying, you have to come and get me. You have to come and get me. I can't take it. I, I, I can't breathe. You have to come and get me. And she's like gasping for air. <laughs> and, and I was like, OK, and she's in a saw. And I'm standing there, I'm thinking, God, what am I supposed to do about this? Okay, I have 30 kids waiting for me in my classroom. I shouldn't even be in this bathroom. Um, so I knock on the door. I say, are you all right? She goes, yeah, I think so. And she came out, and she had this skeleton shirt on. And, you know, holes in her nose with studs sticking out and darts in her ears. And I thought, I go, what's wrong, honey? She goes, I'm just having anxiety. Yeah, I can see why. You've opened the door completely to the wicked one. <clears throat> as simple as it sounds, something so simple. But it starts with protecting them from the enemy. The enemy has an entrance into that girl's life, anxiety. And that's the fruit of her life, anxiety. I brought her back to my room, gave her some hot chocolate to settle her down, um, you know, and then the bell rang. And so I said, let me pray for you. Is your mom coming? So I prayed for her. But I honestly... I had no hope that 
if I prayed deliverance, that they wouldn't come back seven times worse. Because she wasn't in the word. She wasn't being told the truth. She wasn't being protected. You know what I'm talking about, the enemy, or the Bible says, you know, if the enemy comes back later to see if the house is swept clean, in other words, no word of God in there, and he brings seven, six of his buddies. So fathers, you have to protect. Oh, man, I'm riding this dead horse, aren't I? But I, I just see it all the time. I see it all the time. And it starts when they're little. And you might think, well, I, didn't, I wasn't born again until they were 10 years old. Well, it's never too late to start. So we can begin today. That's what I love about the Word of God. We can let it become life in our lives today. So the fifth thing, fathers, that God gave you was the Word that you would teach your children the Word. Change a direction. Fathers have allowed or can I say pushed it off to mothers. Oh, you do that. <clears throat> I'm the breadwinner. You go take care of that. Wrong. It's not the direction that God has. <clears throat> and when I was sitting in <clears throat> the hot tub a week ago or so, and I looked up in the sky and I'm like, okay, God, please, would you please give me something that you would like to say to fathers and men? And I looked up in the sky and the Big Dipper was upside down, and I heard, upside down you turn me. Round and round you turn me. The culture and society has turned the order that God has put in place totally upside down. They've turned it around. They've done anything that they could do to just do what they want to do. That's basically what it is. Everybody's doing what they want to do. There's no order. So I realized that turning things upside down is a, um, it's a change of direction. And when I looked up, um, you know, change of direction in the Bible, um, it took me to Acts 17. And I don't know if you know the story. Um, I printed out 1 through 9. I won't read it all. But um, let me just kind of give you some prelude to what was happening. Paul and Silas were in jail. Remember the story? And they praised God in the... Um, shackles fell off and they were let go, right? <clears throat> okay, so that's the previous to this portion of scripture. And then um, we can jump down to verse 2. So Acts 17, verse 2, and it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and giving evidence that Christ, that the Christ, had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming, proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. They were, they were looking for Paul and Silas. They look, somehow they thought they were, they were in Jason's house. When these people got to Jason's house in verse 6, when they found out that they, did not, they were not there, they couldn't find him, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down, have come here to do the same thing also. Wow. These men, these men, who are preaching the kingdom of God, these men, who are taking seriously these five things that God gave them, it's these men that are turning the world upside down. Verse 7, and Jason had, okay, so finish. It's still in the middle of that statement. These men who have um, turned the world upside down have also come here, and <laughs> Jason has welcomed them. And they all act like the world. No. They all act contrary 
to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them all. So what do I see? I see that we have born-again men who are fathers. I see that the change of the direction of the family, that you are, you are, you know, tending to your garden called your family, and I see the direction changing from your family, not to be that you're leaving your family behind, but now that you've got them to a place, I see the direction going outward. The direction has been inward. inward. You've got to train and raise and cultivate and nurture and and, you know, teach the word of God. And now the direction is going from inward to outward because you're, you've got a handle on this. Yeah. Born again men being the priests of their home, you've got a handle on this now. You've got a handle on the family. Now it's time to take those five things and the principles that you know and go out and live and go out and tell the, the city. And then the city will be turned upside down. I think this is a great word. God is trusting you. It only, he only had 11 disciples, Paul and Silas. I mean, they were two people that turned their city upside down. We have more than that here. We're going to turn this city upside down. But remember the five things. You've got to keep them going. Just like Bishop said last Sunday, you've got to get, get in his presence. So when you find yourself, you're outside of his presence, well, step one, get back in his presence. Work it. Make sure you got a job. Work it. Work that ground. Work that land. Work that thing. Work that plan. If you don't have what you want, fathers, then that means you haven't cultivated it the right way. If you've been married for 20 years and that woman has never um, gotten in the car and come to church, well, you haven't cultivated her. You need to dress her. Go take her to Macy's and buy her some dresses. <laughs> Come on, ladies, are you with me? <laughs> if, if, if your children aren't behaving the way you want, well, then you go back to how am I going to cultivate them? I must need some help in cultivating. I got to wash them with the water of the word. I got to protect them. I got to remove the influence of the world from their lives. I've got to convince them that the truth is what's going to make them free. I've got to show them by living my life what a great life I have serving the king. Yeah. I have, they have to see a witness in me that, th that I have power and authority to change things in my midst. Five things God gave all of us. Change a direction today. Because the ultimate goal is for us to rock this city. If you don't live in this city, then the ultimate goal is for you to rock this city. I didn't stutter. <laughs> the ultimate goal, because you have to know what God is doing and where he's doing it. And right now, he's doing it in this city. Now he, I don't know, maybe he's doing it in some other cities too. I'm sure we're not the only um, people that teach the uncompromised word. That We're not the only people that teach the truth. But I'm here to tell you that these nine families that are here faithfully are enough to ch rock this city, to change the direction of the, where this city's been going, to turn it upside down. Okay. Because it's upside down, we have to turn it upside down. Thank you. Because it's upside down, you know, the order of authority, all that is is not been good, it's the world system. Now we go and we turn it upside down. <laughs> Which will make it right side up. Anything else, Bishop? <laughs> I, I need a little ear plug, you know, so he can like say things and I can act like it's mine. I always get my best revelation from him and the way he preaches the word for sure. Come on. Pastor Aaron prayed on Wednesday. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures so I can be nourished. 
He leadeth me in peace. I see that as beside still waters, peace. He restores my soul. Now, maybe your soul needs to be restored today to the idea of God gave you five things. Maybe you've been wounded and you think that I couldn't be a good father, I can't be a good husband, I couldn't be any of those things. Whatever the case may be, he restores your soul. Yea, though I walk through this place, <laughs> this low place, I'm about to reach the mountain and I'm going to start climbing because God is restoring your soul. He has restored you. He is restoring you. It's an ongoing process. That's why he said, I'm placing you in the garden. I'm putting you in my presence because restoration doesn't happen outside of his presence. That's why there's a broken world because people don't know his presence. We have to take his presence to people. And in that place, they, when they're wounded and when they're broken and when we can bring in the word and bring an answer that creates freedom, that is when they will follow you back to church. That is when this place will be full. God wants the direction to change. And he's going to give you the authority to change it, to turn it upside down. Are you with me? Any questions? I just got out of school, so I'm still in, you know, I, I give you some information. Usually, I can never teach that long in school because I can't keep their attention that long. I have to do some pretty crazy things to keep their attention that long, and sometimes it's just not in me. Some days. Uh-oh, the bishop has a question. Bishop? Oh, good question. That's a great question because there are those academic um, students that always want to know, is this on the test? Not only when is the test, but is this on the test? Should I even listen to what you said or try and practice it because is it on the test? Because if it isn't, I'm... Take out a pencil. The test always begins immediately. Always. Because when you hear the word and you understandeth not, the enemy comes to steal the word. But you all have understood it, right? So then the enemy can't steal it. Doesn't mean you won't have a test, but the enemy can't steal it from you. Amen? Any other questions? <laughs>